Restaurant Unstoppable. Inspire, empower, and transform the industry. The mission statement again, inspire, empower, and and transform. You've definitely inspired us. You've Thank definitely you. empowered us for sure because Thank of the, the lessons you've, you share with us today. I want to focus on transformation now. And, in, 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 I can't help but think being in business now, you opened in 1986, correct? That's correct. 1986. We're now what? How many total? Okay, I'm horrible. I'm, I'm 35, six. So 35 years in business. Yeah. I was born in 85. Easy math. Um, how, how have you found the balance of maintaining and reserving your identity and keeping this place, you know, what it has always been and not changing, not staring too far off, off cor- course of your brand and your identity, but also at the same time having to evolve because the business landscape is changing. How have you found that, that, that balance of maintaining your identity and who you are and what you do without sacrificing that to evolution in the changing landscape of business? That's a very deep question. And um, I think it all comes back to people, you know, uh, uh, I mean, look at the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, we shut down for four months. We could have opened sooner, but I didn't think it was safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and this could be, you know, a very long story, but let me just say this. Uh, we went to a meeting of hospitality people in March downtown at a hotel one Monday morning uh, put on by our uh, tourist commission and the restaurant association and we were going to discuss the pandemic and how we as restaurants can deal with it what we have to do um, in this new landscape and before the meeting started uh, our governor called the head of the restaurant association and said, y'all can do takeout only. You got to shut down the dining rooms. And your food, I feel like is it, that's just does not do justice to your food. Right. Yeah. Now this is transformation. Mm-hmm. That's what 2020 was all about. So we left, the meeting was called off. Uh, Marna and I left. Um, on the way home, I'm calling my chefs, Larry and Emily and Elliot. I said, we're closed on Monday. Mm-hmm. I said, can you please come to my house? Uh, we need to make a game plan for the week. Uh, we can't do indoor dining anymore. <laughs> so we did takeout only, mostly with the stuff on our regular menu, which much of it did not travel well. So Tuesday we did it. Wednesday we did it. Thursday... I was standing in the hall watching customers pick up, most of whom, all of them, are dear friends that we know. Um, This is before we knew about masks, things like that, and I'm seeing Marna six inches from one of our best customers, you know, congregating, three or four people congregating. I shut the place down. Mm -hmm. I said, we are not doing this, honey. It's not safe. And so that was it. Three days of that, and I shut down. And so uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, Congress did one of the best things they've ever done, uh, passing the CARES Act, uh, which increased unemployment. So all 20 of our employees were able to get on unemployment at a subsistence level. And I said, good, now just stay there. Mm -hmm. When are we reopening? I said, I don't know. I shut it down but you're okay. Stay home, stay safe, get your unemployment. If you want to go do side work, fine, but it's not safe for us to be in the restaurant. So that was April. The next month, May, early May, uh, the governor, who I love our governor, by the way, he's done an incredible job and is still doing an incredible job leading us through this. Um, But, you know, restaurants are part of the economy. They need to get open if they can. So, he announced phase one. You could open at 25% capacity. And so a local television station called me and said, Frank, you know, phase one, can we come over and talk about it, about your reopening? I said, um, I'm happy to talk to you, but I'm not reopening. She said, what? I said, I don't think it's safe to open right now. Mm-hmm. She said, well, when are you going to reopen? I said, August. 
August? That seemed like forever. Why August for you? Because that's when the unemployment ended. Got it. Let's just sit tight. Yep. She said, oh, wait, that's part of the story, too. Yep. So they came over, <laughs> and yep. we talked about that. So his part, uh, the, part of the transformation was the four months we were closed. Um, we were the beneficiaries of some very good help. And I will mention a name, the James Beard Foundation. Mm -hmm converted all of their resources to restaurant recovery. And all of us applied for a grant and we got a, a grant that was extremely helpful. For years, getting back to recipes, thousands of people have asked me, Frank, when are you gonna write a cookbook? I'm like, oh. Is this the cookbook that's on the mantle behind us? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I would say, well, when I, when I stop cooking, I'll write. <laughs> <laughs> So you made use of your time. I stopped cooking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Marta said, why don't you write a cookbook for us? I had done one to benefit um, the Houston hurricane victims a few years before. I said, okay. So I wrote one and uh, it took off. And I started, we sell, so still sell it through our website, brightsons.com. And then I did a second one, a summer edition. And um, it's called Stay at Home Cooking mm -hmm. because I'm a chef. Yeah. I gotta get a copy of those before. I, I don't leave. cook home. Don't let me leave without a copy. You know, <laughs> we cook home Sunday night, maybe. Yeah. So now Mara and I are at home cooking every night. <laughs> and Change so the pace, right? It was a lot of fun <laughs> for three months. So this is what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so the books, um, and then I did some of my seasoning blends too, uh, and bottled and sold them. And Marna set up a shipping department. She and Rhonda were in there shipping. Would have eight, ten postal boxes every day going out of my house. Wow. Those books paid our rent for four months. Do you mind getting into the revenue? Can you share numbers with how much you were able to generate? Well, um, I think uh, just during that summer, uh, we probably sold, I don't know, 2,000 of each book. Wow. You know? How much were each book? 20, 25. So do the math. Right. And uh, so... With that and the CARES Act, we had a target date. Got it. Well, actually, there was the first round of PPP, which didn't make sense for many people, including us. But I already had my target date. We're going to open August 1st. Uh, take out only. Okay. Because I'm still not ready, yeah. personally. Yeah. I am not ready to do dining room. What we do in restaurants is the most dangerous thing you can possibly do in a pandemic you get together. for an airborne <laughs> yeah. respiratory virus. Close space. Yeah. Lots of people. Sit close to your family and friends. Take your mask off and eat and talk. Yeah. No. Exactly. I didn't want to expose my staff to it. So uh, about the time we opened, the second phase of PPP came out and we were fortunate enough to get it. Yeah. Now what that did was... Uh, solve the problem of what do we do with tipped employees if we're doing takeout only, mm -hmm. whose salaries were so dependent on gratuities. Mm -hmm. So we were able to pay, everybody came back, except one young lady who moved away. Everybody wanted their job back, and it was my job to give it to them. Mm -hmm. So our servers became takeout specialists and phone answerers. Wow at $18 an hour. Nice. Thank you, PPP. Yeah, that's right? creativity right there, figure it out. We have four of them sitting yeah. around all day long. Mm -hmm. We didn't do online ordering. We don't do online reservations. Mm -hmm. We're old school. Yeah. Talk to me. Mm -hmm. And then people would come pick it up. And so <laughs> it was beautiful. It is beautiful. And then when PPP ran out in, in mid-November, that's when I opened up the dining rooms. I waited as long as I possibly could. Yeah. Do you still feel unsafe? Uh, I still feel we all have to be careful. Yes. Um, I think it's much, much better, and, yeah. and mainly because of vaccinations. Yes, yes. Um, we've covered so much. Uh, one thing that I, I want to make sure, and we pause here. Um, if we go a little over 3 o'clock, will that be an issue for you? Okay, just making sure. Uh, and the one thing I still want to get out of you is – Again, this idea of transformation. Yes. Uh, we are in a very unique time. Our industry is in a very unique time. We're all forced to be still. Yes. And to, to, to choose how we come back. And I think we're, we're, 
it's a great opportunity to really question what's broken with our industry, what's wrong with our industry, and what needs to change in our industry. So somebody like yourself who has so much experience, such a breadth of experience in this industry, entire career in this industry, in your opinion, what's broken with our industry and how should we choose to come back to transform the industry? I, I think the, the restaurant industry is at its most critical, pivotal time. And the reason is the economics do not work anymore. No, it's broken. It's totally broken. What do you mean by that? What's broken about it? The whole nature of restaurant economics are based on food costs and labor costs. Those are so ridiculous, I haven't even looked at last year's financial statement yet. <laughs> so you're saying the costs of labor and food are yes. just constantly rising right now? Yeah. yeah. You know, let's, let's step back a little bit. Uh, you know, every now and then you get a comment about, you know, $35, I can get that bottle of wine at the store for 10 Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. What a ripoff. No, it's not. They're not seeing, that person is not seeing what that revenue contribution does for the overall mm -hmm. experience. It's not a grocery store markup. It's paying for all these people. Mm -hmm. You can open up a shoe store with two or three employees and mark up X amount and do X amount of volume, and the math is pretty simple. Yeah. But in our business, there's so many moving parts from A all the way to Z, starting with suppliers, receiving, storage, mm -hmm. prep, cooking, plating, serving, busing, washing, breaking down, et cetera. Yeah. So that's why that bottle of wine is $35. So, I mean, my transformation, Eric, was this, and it has been since 2020 throw the business model out the door yes so what's your new model what's your new approach how did you change it starts with people okay the number one thing for me and for everyone else is get the right people into your business mm -hmm. the people that want to be there the people that want to do the job how do you find those people how do you keep those people around I teach. What do you teach? Them? I recruit. I pick and choose. What are you teaching? <laughs> what, what are the lessons? Like, what are you trying to instill? Opportunity. How do you teach? You, when I tell young chefs looking for a job, whether it's at Brighton's or anywhere else, think about where you want to go. Ask to go in there and observe mm -hmm. for one hour or do a stage. Put your eyes on that operation. Is that going to be your happy place? Find your happy place first. Some of the greatest restaurants in the world are horrible places to work. Yeah. Find your happy place. Forget the title. Get your foot in the door with the chef you want to learn from, with the crew you want to be with, and let it roll. So when you say you're, you're, you're teaching, or you're, you're like, what are you teaching? What are the things that we need to be teaching young people coming in? And, and get, get specific. Who are we teaching? Yeah, well, the difference between my generation and, and the current status is there's more culinary students. Mm -hmm. Now, that's on the wane, too. Mm -hmm. uh, enrollment at, at school I think that's I kind of a good thing. At, I don't think, yeah. I think kids were getting in trouble getting way too deep in debt to, yes, I to agree. learn on the job. And, I agree. Yeah. Uh, education never loses its value. But um, I believe it had created... Um, high expectations uh, for entry into the workplace. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still going to have to come in as an entry-level person pretty much, or a line cook anyway, uh, and work your way up to a uh, supervisor management position in the kitchen. You still have to earn that. Um, but it does create a, a more well-rounded uh, base of uh, people to draw from and I try and do what Paul did for me is to just give them an opportunity and the tools and just let them see where they want to go and 
you know, Brightson's does not offer uh, health care benefits, 401k. Um, what we do offer is a happy workplace. Um, you know, so you can go work at a hotel and get all that benefit stuff, and that's a wonderful thing. But you can spend some time here too, and and grow, and and, and become the person you want to be. You know, nothing's forever. Chef, I'm going to drill down and go even further. You say give them the tools and the opportunities. Give me examples of the tools. When you Mentorship, one on one. You know, um, come learn from Chef Larry. And what do those lessons that you're giving them look like? What are the things that you're teaching them? Well, for us, and especially Chef Larry, it's consistency in your food and your work. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one thing that rubs him the wrong way, inconsistency. Yeah. And I give you the tools in that binder to make it consistent. And, and you learn some of the business part of it, too, uh, in the sense that we do a full daily inventory of every food product in the kitchen. Um, that's my baby. Who's a part of this? All, all of them. Who's Every one of them. Every person. You yes. Um, you know, we are small and our kitchen is small, as you'll see. Uh, and because of that, we have to do things a certain way. And so there's internal controls. This is a big part of Brighton's operation. Um, they can see each, each day, Larry and I do the ordering. I fax over a sheet with all the orders for the day, today's menu, today's prep list with every chef's name and list of duties every day. Yeah. This is because I am a line cook. I grew up a line cook, and I know the confusion and questions and crap that can go wrong in an orc day. Did this get ordered? Why are we out of this? So we tighten down and try to remove um, the craziness from our work Mm -hmm. and control as much as we can so that they can concentrate on the food. And our whole system at night, uh, which is what they learn, the chefs that are doing the cooking, there's two spots on the line, all they have to do is cook. Mm -hmm. They don't even plate their own food. Mm -hmm. They run out of something, they ask for it, we bring it to them. It's all focused on the food. And what I learned from Paul is, food is at its best when it's made. Mm -hmm. Simple, right? Let's get it from the stove to the table in the shortest amount of time. We don't use trays, we don't use plate covers, we don't even have stations. If there's food in the window, a server, any server will pick it up and deliver it. What I wanna see is steam coming off the (laughs) plate (laughs) at the table. So these are basic fundamental things about our jobs um, that become second nature. Um, And then the, the other thing about our philosophy and our cuisine at Brighton's is that um, I, I have one foot in Creole tradition and, and then the other in whatever's next. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the other, the, one of the questions I had is cause you're so about tradition. You're so about yeah. maintaining history and culture and paying it forward and cementing those things and keeping them the same. But there's a lot of people that, that say you need to keep things fresh to keep your, 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 your kitchen, your staff excited and oh feel yeah like they're growing so how do you find that balance of oh we do tradition and then also e- and evolving yeah uh, well a lot of it is uh, our menu changes seasonally number one uh we're just entering in the crawfish season um which is a big thing for us uh but here's his transformation for you uh when we opened uh 35 years ago and we got that big mm-hmm. review mm-hmm. um I was viewed as, you know, if I remember the, the words exactly, reinventing Creole cuisine. Ooh, how'd that feel? Oof. <laughs> like, like, you know, the hot new kid on the block. Yeah. I still feel like I'm doing pretty much the same thing yeah. 35 years later, but now I'm considered the old school traditionalist. Yeah, yeah. And that's a title I will proudly carry. Yeah. I'll make the gumbo, the trout manier, the bread pudding barbecue shrimp i will be that person because it's harder and harder to find yeah 
Yeah. Chef, I've loved this conversation. Is there anything that you are hoping we would discuss that did not come out of today's chat? I thought you said two days, not two hours. <laughs> we can go along. I'm just getting started. We can go along. <laughs> uh, seriously, I love this conversation. I know you got to start focusing for your, your dinner service. And we still have the speed round. Uh, I just can't say thank you enough. This has been a great chat. Thank you.